Hello and welcome to Inform Friday. I'm Lila Angelaka and I work for Historic Environment Scotland in the technical research team. For the people who are new to this, this is a series of discussions about traditional buildings where we are presenting a short topic each time and then we do a live Q&A. We also introduce you to our Inform Guide series and each session is corresponding to one or more of these published guides. These are short publications that are giving technical advice for homeowners and covering the basics on a number of topics. So in our previous live, we talked about ventilation in traditional buildings and the importance of this. As we mentioned then, and as we're heading to COP26, which, is, uh, which will be held in Glasgow in November this year, the winter series of our talks is focused around the impact of climate change to traditional buildings. And one of the main impacts of climate change is increased precipitation and occurrence of uh, severe weather events. So today we will be talking about traditional rainwater goods, usually ones made of cast iron. And we will have an expert with us, Ali Davy, who is a traditional materials project manager at Historic Environment Scotland and has a special interest in traditional iron work. We will also, of course, have Roger with us, our manager, and we will look at how traditional buildings were designed to deal with rainwater and what you can do to make sure these elements and your building continue to cope with the changing climate. As usual, if you'd like to ask us a question, you can do this now via our Facebook page or log into your YouTube channel with your Google account. The event will be recorded and it's available to watch afterwards at your leisure. All the previous Inform Fridays are also there. You can watch them in, in, in a queue. If we don't manage to answer your question today, we will try to do this at the, at the next session. Or if it's something quite specific and we need to see photographs, we will ask you to email us at technicalresearch at hgs.scot. So it's now time to properly welcome Ali Davy and Roger Curtis. Hello. Hi, team. <clears throat> So most of us know that the efficient disposal of water through rainwater goods and drainage is essential to the well-being of all buildings. But it is especially so now as precipitation and extreme weather events are forecasted to increase due to climate change. And when we talk about rainwater goods, we usually refer to gutters, downpipes, roads in Scotland, but also drainage. They all provide an important function in carrying water away from the building and preventing it from penetrating it. So the regular maintenance is actually crucial for the proper function of the building. If they're neglected, on the other hand, uh, this can have significant consequences of the building's fabric, some of which may be very costly to repair down the line. Generally, and as we've covered before when we talked about roofs, uh, it is best to check them twice a year, once before the winter and after a storm, uh, when along with checking your roof, when you're, uh, yeah, when you're out taking your, your roof using binoculars. So the bo most popular material for the manufacture of traditional rainwater goods has been cast iron. So we will cover the basics on the upkeep of cast iron rainwater goods and what to watch out for. But we will also cover some other aspects of water management, such as architectural detailing, which was carefully designed to shed rainwater away from the building and its fabric. Um, such as cornices, parapets, and sometimes these elements were sacrificial to the rest of the building fabric, such as the walls. So Ali will tell us a little bit more about why cast iron rainwater goods are important and how to properly care for and maintain them. So to you, Ali. Thanks, Leela. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about um, just the background and the significance of cast iron, uh, cast iron rainwater goods, and then I'll touch on some of the uh, the most common uh, problems that you might encounter. Um, and later on, and when he's speaking. So from the early 19th century, architectural cast iron products, oh, excuse me, that's my dog. Um, from the early 19th century, architectural cast iron products were becoming more and more popular. A technology was developing and enabling the mass production of cast iron goods on a scale that previously wasn't popular, uh, wasn't uh, possible. Um, and so this made them increasingly affordable. And of course, all of this was happening at a time when and there were a series of building booms. So foundries were being established all across by the later 19th century. Um, every town uh, would have had its own, uh, its own foundry. 
by the mid 1850s, enormous foundries were being established, the likes of um, uh, Walter McFarlane, and Co, George Smith and Co in Glasgow, they were two of the, the lead uh, competitors, but there were lots of other um, really significant foundries operating at that time. These firms became uh, some of the largest producers of architectural cast ironwork in the world and were shipping their products all around the globe. So you can find today, uh, you can still find today examples of their products in South Africa, Malaysia, South America, India and um, many, many more, more places um, around the world. So the iron founding industry in Scotland really is extremely significant historically. Scotland was a leading player in the global development um, of architectural cast ironwork. So what survives today is really important and, and really important to, to, to preserve. Cast iron is obviously a robust and incredibly versatile material. Uh, there's, there's a reason it became so popular in the 19th century. It was seen as hygienic, portable, durable, and of course, versatile, as I've mentioned. It could be applied to so many different products from small things like cooking pots to entire building facades. And of course, it was perfect for rainwater goods. So affordable cast iron rainwater goods really changed the face of buildings. These products offered a new platform for decoration and design, and it became common to see really ornate rones, hoppers um, and downpipes in a wide range of styles uh, being applied to, to buildings. Manufacturer catalogues were filled with endless selections of gutters. You can see some samples here on the screen and that's just one page. Um, uh, decorated hoppers, rones and the brackets that would hold them in place. And of course, down pipes as well um, and ears to hold them in place. And all of these were, were, were possible to purchase in really decorative ornate styles as well. And of course, Many of these survive today, still doing their original job, really testament to the inc incredible durability of this fantastic um, material. Um, and, and also quite often a reminder of the playfulness of cast iron uh, design as well. So if you're walking around, um, you know, Victorian urban environments, it's really worthwhile just looking up and taking the time to look at the rainwater goods because quite often they're really ornate and quite special. Okay, so that's just a really quick introduction to the, to the history of cast iron work. We'll move on now to look at some of the most common issues that you're likely to, to encounter. Now, I, I'm sure I'll have missed a few common problems, so please do pop any questions that you have in the chat if there's anything I haven't covered. And of course, Roger will be talking a bit more about defects uh, later on, so he'll probably catch anything um, that I haven't covered. First of all, as Leela has already mentioned, regular maintenance really is the best way um, of, uh, of avoiding, um, of, uh, avoiding uh, problems and minimising the risk of problems. So avoiding problems in the first place is always preferable to having to fix problems um, after they've occurred. So getting your rones cleared every year, making sure you clear blockages as soon as you spot them, helps ensure that your cast iron work is able to dry out between wetting cycles. And this really is the key to uh, keeping your rainwater goods in good condition. If your cast iron work can dry out periodically, um, obviously its job is to remove water, but it's not always raining in Scotland. Um, so if it can dry out periodically, it generally performs and lasts pretty well, even without paint. For cast iron work, we generally advise applying fresh paint every five years or so. There's really no hard and fast rule. It, it, it varies from building and to building. So really what we would, would say is just check your any cast iron work that you have on your property annually um, and uh, just check your paint work and, and, uh, and look after it accordingly if you, know, if you see problems and, or, or degradation. So you can coat the inside of your rones with a bitumen paint and then just use a standard cast iron paint system such as a zinc based primer, a build coat and just any gloss paint or a high oil gloss paint um, for the bits that you can see. So the hoppers, the underside of your rones and the downpipes. Um, if you're getting your cast iron work painted in situ, always try to pick warmer, drier weather. Um, applying paint to dry cast iron 
really is the best way to ensure that your new paint uh, will last well and thoroughly protect your ironwork. So if you paint in the middle of winter, you're going to be applying your coatings to damp ironwork, which is likely to cause your, your, your brand new paint to fail in a much short, a shorter period of time. So really, I'd always advise um, against painting um, uh, against painting in the winter months when it's particularly cold and damp. Really, it, it's a recipe for, to, for, for disaster, you know, after all of your effort uh, to apply the paint and, and clean your ironwork before applying it. Um, painting the backs of rainwater goods uh, can sometimes be problematic as well. Um, depending on the design, there's sometimes inaccessible parts. And really, there's no easy solution other than taking them off the building to get at the rear the rear faces, the bits that you can't see. Um, however, what I would say is that unless there's an obvious sign of a problem happening, um, so long as you keep your gutters clear and you clear blockages straight away, you should be okay. So long as airflow can, can, um, can run through your downpipes, that will help dry out the cast iron from the inside. So another common issue that you might encounter is uh, leaking, um, is leaking rones. This often happens at the joints. So rones were installed in sections which overlap each other. And these overlap joints were traditionally filled um, with putty. And over time, that putty can get washed out. It's really simple to replace the putty. And there are loads of off-the-shelf products um, out there that you, that you or your, your contractor um, can get hold of. So it's, it's an easy fix. Um, if the leak is caused by corrosion, if the, the holes that it's caused are really small, you might be able to uh, just get your, your contractor to repair those using an epoxy. For more serious corrosion, you might need to replace the corroded section. And I'll touch on that um, just in a couple of minutes. So um, cast iron is durable and strong. Um, and it's also very hard metal, and that means that it's, it's brittle. So in practical terms, that means that it can fracture if a lot of force is exerted on it. So I'm thinking here particularly of winter time, if a downpipe gets blocked and isn't cleared, the water trapped in that downpipe can freeze. And as we all know, ice takes up more space than water does. That expanding space puts pressure on your downpipe and cause, can cause it to fracture and to crack. Um, and if that happens, really the simplest solution is to just fractured uh, section. Downpipe and rounds are plain standard downpipe, cast iron downpipes and um, half round um, gutters. Um, if they don't stock what you need, there are quite a few specialist suppliers out there who are really likely to have a close match if not an exact match for what you're looking for. In Scotland, um, there are three foundries that specialise in traditional cast iron work. Um, they have a huge stock of patterns, so it's a call. So they are Ballantines in Bowness, Charles Lang and Sons in Fife, and Specialised Castings in Denny. Um, and they specialise in traditional cast iron work. If they don't have what you need, there are suppliers that special goods, um, found UK foundries like Long Bottoms, um, and you can Google search and that will bring up a range of, of suppliers. Do be aware that the quality and thickness of castings, all cast iron products are the same. So going to specialist foundries that deal particularly in traditional cast iron work is usually a good way to ensure that you're buying good quality um, products. Um, specialists who deal um, specifically with rainwater goods sometimes also produce die cast rainwater goods, which is a slightly cheaper alternative. And any good supplier can talk you through the pros and cons um, of these of these options. So, so that's been a really quick introduction to cast iron rainwater goods. I hope you found it interesting and useful, and I'm of course happy to answer any questions that you have. That's great. Thank you, Ali. Um, just to let people know that there's been, we, we are aware that uh, there's a bit of an issue with Alice's connection, so she was breaking up a bit. But if you, if there's something that you missed or you didn't hear or didn't understand, just pop a question. Um, so thank you for that. And let's see if we have any questions for Ali now. And if it's something that we don't answer now, obviously, we will try to do so at the end after Roger's sort of part, uh, together with any questions for him. So shall we maybe give it a few seconds to see if we have any questions for Ali? 
I'm not sure we have anything yet. So maybe maybe we just move on to Roger, who is uh, who will be talking to us about defects and common repair issues for design and what to look out for. So Roger, to you. Right. Hello. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Lila. So um, yeah, just running you through really the the sort of areas of a building where where these uh, products and materials will be used, and um, <clears throat> I tend to start at the top of the building and work my way down. So shortly you'll get an image of uh, a, a sort of architect's drawing of, of what I'm calling a parapet gutter. So this is the lead bit behind the behind the masonry that uh, sometimes sits on the front of a house. We don't all have this. This is pretty smart stuff, but it happens more often than you think in Scotland. And notice this uh, lead area behind the behind the wall, the parapet, um, into which the water gathers, and then it goes down through what's sometimes called a spigot into the cast iron hopper head that Alex, uh, that Ali described to you. And that's all that's all fine and dandy, but it's quite vulnerable to getting blocked. And if that does get blocked, you basically have an unplanned swimming pool uh, on the top of your roof that then will overspill to the inside of your house and getting all the wood and, and the timber behind the wall wet. Stone can get wet and dry out, not for too long, but it, it'll do that. Whereas timber and water over a long period is a really bad idea and this is a picture of a kind of grand place uh, near Hamilton actually the remains of what was part of the Hamilton uh, palace estate where the hopper behind or the, the the lead valley behind has become blocked and look how wet that that masonry is but don't just worry about the masonry think of all the timber that's sitting there all nice and damp um, and and basically a, a kind of compost heap going on so um, that's just one of the effects that you'll get um, Here's a building in Edinburgh. This is on the south side of town, just top end of Causeway side. And again, you've got the big masonry parapet there that you can see that has obviously become blocked and the overflow out onto the uh, to the outside. And they've got water running all the way down the building, all four floors getting a good soaking. Uh, and that's been like that for quite a long time because I can see the traces of green. And then the downpipe, the metal, the metal downpipe, the cast iron downpipe is uh, you can just see it in, in there. Uh, not doing its job uh, for the want of getting up onto the roof and clearing that uh, we could be avoiding or you could be avoiding many many thousands of pounds worth of damage primarily from a potential dry rot outbreak on the inside of those of those four or five flats there so this is a really important area keep keep these things working once the inside of your house gets wet bad things will happen i can almost promise you um, and as Lida said, the intensity of the rainfalls uh, increasing now, and, and sometimes the volume in during these floods is, is increasing. And what can also happen with, with folks' buildings is that alterations, adjustments, a bit of a Friday afternoon piece of work maybe by somebody. So this image here shows um, a, a sort of building of the 1850s or so, and a porch has been added in, uh, and you can see the downpipe from the roof coming down, sort of middle, top middle, uh, of, of the image there going into the the new extension uh, thing but it's not working terribly well and then the the spigot the bit that takes the water from the the the, the OG the cast iron profile gutter that you can see there is really quite small and it's become blocked and you can tell there's green stuff everywhere if you have green stuff on your wall that means there's quite a lot of water there for more time than there should be and that means something is going wrong so be aware of, 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 of this kind of staining and what it's telling you. And I hope it's fairly obvious that if a lot of water is coming down that downpipe middle, middle center, that's actually overflowing over the wall. Um, so that arrangement needs redoing. So it's not the downpipes are not uh, are too small necessarily. The top one looks fine, but it's just overflowing everywhere. The lower one is definitely on the small side, as you can probably see, causing these blockages. So this is kind of boring but important stuff and really keep your keep keep your eye out for it on on the next image um we've got uh, some uh, a cast iron profile gutter uh roan sitting on the top of a, of a wall head there and and you can see it architecturally it's good but if you just go back to the previous image there you'll see this bit, a bit of a staining on the wall where the joints have have failed and ali spoke about that it's kind of doesn't look too much but actually think how wet that that masonry is behind and what it's doing to your timber work uh, and resealing that joint uh, as Ali said is, is quite a high priority okay well let's let's move on then so the next image we've got um, uh, another uh, another shot of, of a, a profiled uh, 
OG gutter, as you can see. Um, this time it's going into some, what's sometimes called a swan neck, which is that curved bit <clears throat> that takes it down. Those are quite prone to blocking because of the way that leaves and things build up in the turn. And then the other bit to notice is it comes out directly onto the roof. Now that might have been fine in 1860, but actually with the volumes we're getting now, that is tending to slightly spray and over overflow um, off the lower, uh, the lower um, uh, rome there as well, wetting the masonry. So after heavy rain, see how much of your masonry is wet. It, it, it should not be soaked wet. It should be mostly dry because the rainwater goods and the roof are taking it all away without splashing and overflowing or overtopping as is sometimes used. So for my mind, that, that image there is, is a vulnerable point of, um, of, of rainwater drainage on a roof, particularly the, the sort of lower left bit where you've got uh, water from two pitches coming down into really quite a small uh, little spigot on the underside and then another the curve of the swan neck and in, in the probably of lead formed of lead uh, on the bottom left of that of that image so that's just something to be careful of there and and it's easy to talk about rainwater goods as if it's all about the stuff high up but the next image will show you where does it go and uh, this is a bit of work that's going on at uh, a house i visited recently where in fact that was just going into the ground uh, just literally the ground around the building uh, and that's really no good at all, because if your building is sitting on a wet pond, uh, you'll get a lot of rising damp, the place will smell, your timber work and your joists will start to get humid, humidity is not good for timber, all sorts of bad things start to happen. So here we're, we're, we're through the, uh, the builder is putting in a new uh, plastic land drain to get that water away from the building. Um, you can see the stump of the downpipe just there, that went into fresh earth. That was it, no, no other drainage. So a bit of remedial work is sometimes needed. Um, and maybe what you had before back in the day was good enough, but I would suggest now with the rain we're having, particularly in the winter and the forecast for the winter, that won't be good enough. And uh, my, my next image, back to, back to defects and bad things again, um, here is a, a, a downpipe coming off um, a roan and, and, and a swan neck, top, top middle as I have indicated. That has become blocked. You can see the staining with the discolored stone in the corner there. Look how green it is. That was like that for about a year and about a year and a half. All the times you go further down, the wall's getting wetter. And guess what the inside of the house looked like in that area? So the next picture will show the inside of the porch, which was starting to show um, signs of damp stress. And uh, below that image, just out of out of the frame. Um, is a row of hooks for the coats and hats and stuff and that had completely decayed away to compost uh, through the action of dry rot and wet rot. The condensation is quite interesting, uh, is showing uh, material, building material at a much lower temperature. So you're getting spots of condensation showing you that that's at a lower temperature. It's a lower temperature because it's damp and it's wet because that downpipe on the other side um, has been soaking that wall for the previous uh, the previous uh, uh, year and a half or so. So a very simple defect that could have been cured very easily. Look what was happening inside. So moving on then, um, and just to give you another idea of, of what a block downpipe might look like. So this is um, this is uh, an outside view, obviously, and uh, the downpipe there has been blocked underground. The water has backed up. And if you look carefully, you'll see um, some of the green around it and then the salt staining on the on the on the wall. This actually has been un, unblocked now and the wall is gradually drying out. But you can see the effects. The pointing has been washed out. You're getting salt staining and, and, and damage to the stone. Lord knows what the situation is inside. I presume it's all OK, but uh, they were very, very lucky there. Often, if you see a downpipe just going to gravel like that, be question it. Where's it going? How is that getting away from the building? And in many cases, it's not going anywhere. And uh, the next picture shows what I might like to uh, that some of the effects on timber. This is a, a timber joist taken out of a building where you had a soaking wet masonry wall. And you see this cuboidal cracking on that structural timber, which is a classic um, feature of, of dry rot. Dry rot is a wonderful separate topic on its own. But uh, suffice to say, dry rot needs a fair amount of water in the right place to allow this um, this timber decay. Okay, well, the next picture 
um, takes you again to the bottom of a building. And uh, if there's something worse than having rainwater in the wrong place, there's a lot worse in having, um, how do I put it delicately, uh, raw sewage in the wrong place. And clean rainwater is clear, might have the odd leaf in it, but it's you know pretty clean really. This stuff, that sort of opaquey blue, mm, that means it's been close to humans for more than you might wish. If you have that at the bottom of your building, yeah, you're, you're carrying lots of other factors over and above the fact that it's uh, going to cause damp problems. And uh, again, this has happened because the below ground drainage, the bit you can't see, has been blocked. So that might need rodding and pressure jet clearing, possibly even a CCTV, CCTV inspection to show what the what the condition of the of the drain underground is. Um, and until you know um, where your water is going, how it's getting away from the building, uh, you can never be entirely sure of what condition your foundations are going to be. Often, um, there's an arrangement called a gully trap that uh, the next picture will show, uh, where you have a, a, a sort of U-bend, like in like in your lavatory, that was designed to prevent um, drain smells coming back up. But these need clearing quite often. So th this is a feature of sort of generally older buildings with ceramic um, drainage, although there are plastic equivalents. Um, and the next slide will show you the effect of, of, of a blockage on this type of arrangement. So you've got the U-bend there choked up with debris and rubbish. You've got your pipe going into the ground. You can't see it. You can't get near it. How could you clear it? And the water is backing up the wall, uh, and you can see it coming out of the first joint um, in, in the length of the downpipe there. And, and the architect here has, has shown some of the damage to the to the fabric of the building, the spalling, um, the spalling render, the bricks, uh, uh, being exposed underneath, but also think how wet that wall is and what that dampness uh, is ha having an effect on your internal tim timber and the internal conditions. And I would suspect that you could probably smell that actually. Some folk have a good nose for wine and fish and all that sort of stuff. Um, I unfortunately have a very good nose for damp uh, and I can kind of go into a room and go <laughs> and normally tell if there's, if there's something not quite right. Um, so do think about the whole journey of the water from the top to the bottom through the mechanism of the rainwater goods that we've outlined and even you know get all that but but please think about the below ground stuff it's boring it's dirty it's smelly but it's really really important so make sure you have that um so i'm going to probably probably stop there and um leela will now round up and and happy for for questions and things yeah, that's great. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we've had some interesting questions coming through. So the first one is from Henry through Facebook. My rooms are cast iron. Recently, when it rains, uh, they overflow. They're not blocked. When they overflow, the water pours into the top of the window directly underneath the room. It seems as if the water is overflowing at the back of the room, which seems to be sitting on the wall as opposed to attached to the side of the building. Um, interested to know what could be wrong good question there's, there's possibly two things yeah going i might on. uh yeah i'll let roger answer that one yeah there might be there might be a couple of things here the first one is the the, the spigot the bit the round iron bit that sticks down from the from the uh the the, the roan might be quite small and quite often they are or might have been replaced with a with a piece of work that is smaller yet they might have inserted it in. The second one, and, and other comments on the on the chat have referred to this, is the run, the the, the level at which the the uh, the wall is set, or rather the the angle at which the the roan is set, because it's got to run. It, the water's got to run away. So quite often they're just slightly off the level. It's it's not noticeable, but you need to have it. Uh, so building settlement um, might have changed that, or, or or or. But I suspect you might have a sort of blockage. Um, when it's hoofing with rain and you want to be inside, it's a very good time to stand outside. I, I, it's madness, I know, and people will look at you strangely, but that's a very good way of understanding what's happening. So I think perhaps a bit of um, check, checking that, that, that swan neck or that spigot again, um, or looking at, the, uh, looking at the run and seeing which end is fuller. The end with the spigot going down into the downpipe should be the low end, obviously, and the far end where there's no downpipe should be should be at a higher slightly higher and should be more or less empty 
And and to add to that, I mean, I think it's always good to check if what you have there is sufficient for the rain you're having uh, in terms of width and um, the downpipes, because sometimes changes have happened and things have been altered. So it's always good to check that your rainwater goods are sufficient. Yeah, and um, quite often they, they often put sometimes an additional downpipe from another roof to save on a downpipe somewhere else. So what was fine for one pitch is now having to cope with two. That seems to happen quite a bit. And and to add to that, the, we had a comment from Mick saying about the the basically the brackets that can bend, and then you you have um, basically a downpipe that's on an angle, and then it doesn't it doesn't collect the water as it should. So it's always good to check your gutters a level and allowing the water to run to the downpipe. So thank you, Mick, for that. Um, Another question that was from Carol, it was about, she, I think she couldn't hear the uh, the foundries, but we put them into the chat, hopefully. So it's Ballantines in Bonus, Charles Lang and Sons in Fife, they used to be in Edinburgh, and Specialized Castings in Denny, and uh, Long Bottoms Foundry. Hopefully these are on the chat as well, if I said them too quickly. Um, another question is from Victoria on Facebook. Has anyone looked at the plastic mock cast iron replacements that we've seen at the ideal home show, etc.? Any information on whether these are any good? We're trying to be sympathetic to the house, but also sensible regarding maintenance. Um, I'm happy to take that one. Um, in terms of conservation, we would always recommend like for like replacements. If your rainwater goods are made of cast iron, we would recommend you replace them with cast iron. I know there's loads of options in terms of kind of plastic alternatives that look like the real thing. Um, they're just not as robust. And I think from a sustainability point of view and longevity point of view, you're always better uh, sticking with cast with cast iron. So that would always be um, be our advice. Um, the other thing with plastic I've noticed um, um, is that they tend to distort slightly so that over time they bend and move and then you have the problem that, that Mick mentions where they're no longer running true uh, and you have dips which then fill with water that then puts more weight on it so therefore it, it dips and distorts yet further. So it's a, yeah, I mean it kind of works but probably as Ali said not, not, not entirely for the long term. Um, I'm very conscious in this that we've spoken about cast iron as if there's no other material on the planet for for um, for rainwater goods. In Scotland, there is a tradition of zinc, um, and indeed in some places lead. But actually, the cast iron is the dominant one. So that's the that's what we kind of focused on today. Yeah, and I just want to say, especially if you have sort of a mix and match uh, <laughs> rainwater good system, and you're putting plastic where you have cast iron, just to make sure that the connections, everything fits together because often they don't or, you know, they're, they're not well put together. So you have breakages and misconnections, which result to what Roger showed earlier. Um, we'll wait to see if we have any more questions. Aluminium hey. is Oh, is that we got, I was just going to say, aluminium is often put up as an alternative, a sort of halfway house between cast and and, and plastic, and and it it, it has its place. Um, my own experience is is not great, and uh, I find particularly where the fastenings go, where you join the aluminium with its neighbour, often with a ferrous or a, a steel bolt, you have um, you have electro um, electrochemical reaction between the two metals. And so you get accelerated decay at the joints, which is sort of kind of irritating. Uh, just on that note, until we wait uh, to see if we have further questions to point out, I mean, we will hopefully have a, another session on this, but if you do have an elevation that's getting really wet and you've addressed your gutters and wet rainwater goods, it might be a uh, time to look at other things like uh, lead cloaking and like putting lead on your parapets just to protect the building fabric underneath. But hopefully we'll have another session to show what, what can be done to address yeah, this. So, that's, and so we've tried to sort of keep rainwater goods in, in, in one basket, so to speak, but the whole the, the sort of bigger climate change adaptation uh, story applies to masonry elements as well. Uh, often people sort of think in very sort of straightforward terms of, of, of slates and, and walls, but it's that sort of bit in the middle that, that Leela's mentioned, parapets, skew copes, particularly chimney heads. We could talk for hours about chimneys. 
um, also need attention to. But um, if you get the down, down pipes right, you, you've got a long way to starting the journey. Uh, we have a question for probably for Ali from Ian on Facebook. Is there any way to stop the corrosion on the inside of cast iron downpipes? Uh, I would say unless Roger has an ingenious uh, suggestion, I would say no. Um, but if they're getting to dry out, you know, so long as they're not black blocked, you're going to have air movement going up and down the pipe. So I think it, it it's yeah. fine, and it's that's just its job. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. If you've got corrosion and pitting on the inside or the outside for that matter, it generally means it's it's kind of wet for too long. It, it, it's got that unfortunate mixture of, of of water and sludge and air and frost and everything. That, that That's the problem. If they're just free flowing and dry, it gets wet, dries out. No problem. And also just, just to let folk know, because we've had this question through our inquiry line a few times, that when, when people are getting new gutters uh, or downpipes in, these are often not painted. So you should make sure you arrange to have them painted at the same time when you have the scaffolding and they're being put up. Yeah, particularly applies in marine environments. So um, the chlorides in, in, in salt water, air, and, and the, the, the sort of salty wind you get with the spray, that tends to hit cast iron work pretty hard. So there, there you need to be right on top of things. And, and as soon as you start getting spalling, that, that's when you need to be on uh, sort of right on top with your maintenance um, as a way, because the sodium chloride in the, in the salt uh, affects, accelerates the, the, the rusting process. Okay, uh, we'll wait maybe a little bit and just, just to say that um, our next live is going to be on the 5th of November, so that's very close to the actual uh, COP26 event. And so we are going to be talking about energy efficiency upgrades for traditional buildings and we will show your latest, one of our latest refurbishment projects, which is Hollywood Park Lodge in Edinburgh which went from an EPC band F to a band C. So I hope you can tune in for that. Um, yeah, so any any sort of pre-questions on, on energy efficiency in older buildings, happy to sort of start stack, stacking those up so we can perhaps shape the presentation a little bit. And as Leela said, we'll be looking at Hollywood Park Lodge, EPCs, solid walls, the, all the stuff. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. So maybe we um, we finish here and we'll see what else comes into our mailbox. And we can, as we've said, we can address specific issues via email. So thank you very, very much for joining us. And thank you to Ali and Roger for their great input. And if you've enjoyed this, leave a comment and follow us for more. As I've said before, the previous informed Friday lives are on the, um, sort of on the YouTube channel, so you can see the, the ones before. The next event will be on the 5th of November and it's energy efficiency upgrades. And um, yeah, thank you again for joining us and have a good day. Bye everyone. Hooray. Right.